first Sunday of Advent, and Advent is that season where we, we, we wait, we pause, uh, and we anticipate the arrival of Christ. While it happened the first time as a baby, we look forward to the second Advent, and it's just a thing that kind of points us, focuses us toward Christmas. We look at the gifts that come to us through the Christ child, hope, joy, and peace, and love. And this year we've been looking at this Advent idea through the lens of some familiar Christmas films that we all know and love. They, they kind of shape our holiday, and there's probably a couple that your family sit and watch together, and it's not Christmas until you watch this movie. So today we're going to look at the concept of love, the gift of love through the lens of a Christmas story. And if you've never seen a Christmas story, uh, it will be playing on TNT approximately 47 times over the next uh, three days. So you can catch it on there. But a Christmas story is all about love. But Christmas in general is all about love. It's about God's love for us. That's what we mention over and over, that God stepped into this world because he loves us. So Christmas is all about love, and that's why I like celebrating this gift kind of at the end as we get closer to Christmas, this gift of love. But the word love and even the idea of love ha has kind of been hijacked to a certain point. It's kind of been hijacked by the Hallmark Corporation, <laughs> where love becomes this, this fluffy, sentimental, gooey, sticky kind of infatuation or this range of emotion, but that's not love. Real love is not about infatuation, and it's not really even about emotion. Real love is a choice. It's a choice to make an investment. It's a choice to put someone above yourself. And everything, and think about this, because you do not have this relationship with anyone else. Everything that God has done, is doing, or will ever do for you, is motivated out of love. Every single thing that God has, is, or will do for you is motivated out of love, whether it's the fact that, that we are his creation, the fact that, that God gave you, he loves you enough to give you free will. God could have created robots, people that would have automatically loved him without choice, but he bestows upon us Free will. We are given, he has enough love for us to give us the revelation of his word to us. He gave us the law, this idea that there is a certain way that society should live and be, and he loves us enough to give us that. The scripture that was shared with you this morning from 1 John chapter 4 says, Let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever has been born of God and knows God, anyone who does not love, does not know God, let me say that again, anyone who does not love does not know God. So jo John actually puts a condition on your relationship, your knowledge of God hinges on whether you love. Why? Because God is love. He doesn't say that God loves you. That's throughout Scripture and other places. He says that God is love. That is his very nature, his very ethic is love. God will never act toward you motivated by any other edict than love. And, and even things like accountability, judgment, discipline, those all come out of love. And if you're a parent, you understand that, right? That sometimes <laughs> discipline comes from a place of love. The Bible says in Proverbs that God disciplines those he loves. So God is love. But again, the, the world kind of hijacks this and they say that love is God. That if you just, I love you and you love me, and as long as we operate in love, then that's godly. But that's not the case. It has to be the right kind of love, and that's the love we're going to talk about for Advent. See, God is love, and because of that, we are wired to love ourselves. Why? Because we were created in the image of God. Genesis 126 says that we were created, man in his own image, in the image of God, male and female, he created them. So if God is love, and Genesis 126 says that we were created in the image of God, then that means we have the capacity, in part, to also be love. But we may love inappropriately. We may love in, in a mis 
misguided, misdirected fashion. In fact, what is, what is sin? But sin is loving something. Sin is loving a habit, loving a person, loving a relationship, loving a thing more than you love what God has for you. Sin is loving something more than the parameters God has given us to live our life by. So while we are wired to love, we just carry the greater capacity to love inappropriately or in a misdirected way. And the Christmas story, or a Christmas story, the movie, is a movie about love. It's about a kid that wants one thing and one thing only. And what is that thing? Not just a Red Ryder BB gun, a Red Ryder carbon action 200 shot model air rifle. <laughs> Take a look. Well, here it is, folks. <laughs> you know what happens when you don't get your son one of these when he's seven, eight, nine years old? He buys one when he's 37. I am the proud owner of this Red Rider BB gun. It is unloaded and the safety is on. But it's so silly because that was like $24. It has almost no value, but the entirety of the movie is about uh, his obsession, or as he says, his mania, his desire for this Red Rider BB gun. He wrote, he wrote a paper, but he had a fantasy where he wrote a paper about it, and A++++. And when we look at this child's obsession with something so insignificant, it is ridiculous, but familiar. Because each and every one of us have been obsessed when love consumes us. That's what love has the capacity to do, right? Love consumes us, and we get our eyes focused on stuff, or food, or passion, or let's face it, sin, where our mania and our desire for something is so strong, we won't listen to anybody. What's the, what's the mom's response? What's the proper response to giving a child a BB gun? Right, everybody knows that. And you've pursued situations, you've been consumed by something so significantly, and, and your mama told you to walk away, and your daddy told you to walk away, and your preacher's up here talking every week about that thing you're doing and how you shouldn't do it because it's not God's best for you, and you say, you know what, it'll be different for me. It doesn't apply to me. And so sometimes when mom says no, we have to feel like we have to appeal to a higher authority. Have you ever had something on your mind, something you're consumed with, something you love, something you're pursuing, and everyone tells you that it's a bad idea? And so what do you do? You, you're a good Christian person. You, you appeal to God's word, and you open it up, and almost immediately when you open it up, it says, well, you'll shoot your eye out. Everyone is, <laughs> everyone is exactly right in what they're saying to you, because that's the reality. Everyone is warning us because... We sometimes just don't know how to direct and express our affections. But here's the reality in the world that we live in. When you allow love to consume you, ultimately you will get exactly what you asked for. And it usually goes something like this. Our love is oftentimes all-consuming, and we put our affections in the wrong things. And then exactly what will happen, happens. We're left concocting stories when exactly what happens is what they said would happen. Maybe I can say this about it. Maybe they won't notice. And here's the thing. This is not just a concept in this movie, and this is not just a concept in your life. This is a, this is a hallmark biblical principle. Because in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But what the one who sows to the Spirit will reap from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Do not be deceived. That, that word means delusional. Do not be delusional. God is not mocked. Whenever this verse was shared with me as a young child, it was always shared in almost kind of a threatening manner. Right? You know, God is not mocked, and what you sow, you will reap. But you know, at its very essence, this is not a negative verse. 
nor, nor is it really a positive verse. This is just a reality verse. That you have the option in life to, to focus your affections and focus your consumption on things of the Spirit, and you will reap things from the Spirit if you do that. Likewise, you have the option to, to indirect and misdirect and focus your love and your affections and your consumptions on the flesh, on the desires, on the stuff. And when you do that, you will get exactly what you think you should get from that. It's the law of logic. It's not just a biblical concept. It's a logical concept. If you allow your love for inappropriate things, no matter what the thing is, if you allow that love to consume you, you'll shoot your eye out. So there's another type of love in, in this movie, and it's not the love of a child for a BB gun. It's the love of an old man. The, the dad in this movie is a stubborn, determined old man. He, he fights with his neighbor's dogs. Uh, he fights with his furnace. He tries to break his own record, changing a tire. Like, this is just a man that needs a win. And he, he's determined. And one, one morning, he's filling out a crossword puzzle. And if he, if he sends in this crossword puzzle completely filled out, he has the opportunity to win $50,000. And so he sends it in, and he wins, but he does not win the $50,000, but he does win a major award. <laughs> now, if you think I didn't buy this lamp, you must be new here. Oh, they sell miniature versions, they sell magnets, but no, this is the real deal, and yes, it's functional. Now again, can you imagine, eyes up here folks, can you imagine being so enamored with something? so impressed with something, so devoted to something, and this is important, that you didn't even want. It just represents the win. And that's ridiculous to us, but also very familiar when our love is misguided. We, we put all our focus and all of our energy when our love is misguided into something that we didn't even want it to begin with. But we like what it represents. We like what it says. And we put all of our energy and all of our focus. We're like an animal with blinders on. Because of what this represents. No one. Who would buy this? <laughs> Nobody would buy this. But that's what happens when our love is misguided. And it's just a representation. In Matthew chapter 19, a man comes to Jesus. It says, Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Imagine all the people that are, that are given the call in Scripture to follow Christ, and, and, and some of them just did not believe he was the Messiah. He, he told parables about people being too busy or having too much stuff going on, or, or that he just wasn't quite radical enough. But this guy just couldn't do it because he had really great stuff. He didn't want to let go of his stuff. And I think maybe that's even the problem in in good church folk 
Christianity. Where we say, what do we have to do to be saved? And there's a list, and it's like, well, I keep all those rules. I don't do the bad stuff, and I try to do the good stuff. And Jesus says, okay, yeah, but let go of that thing. Now, this guy had a lot of stuff, so for him it was his stuff. If you have no stuff, it's not your stuff. But it's something. It's something that you hang on to, and Jesus says, let go of that and follow me. It it might be how you negotiate your resources. It might simply be how you negotiate your greatest resource, your time. And Jesus says, you know what? I need more of that. I need you to work me in to your life more. And we go away disappointed because, well, I've, I've got great. i got great stuff. How disappointing would it be? So what happens when we misdirect our love and when our love is misguided and we put it into something that is so ridiculous, something we didn't even want, ultimately, it will all come crashing down to the foot before the verses. When we align our love in the wrong way, God is not mocked. We will reap what we sow. And ultimately, you will be left holding the broken pieces of a lamp you never even wanted. But you got so focused on it. So that's when love consumes us, when it consumes us with the wrong things, when it's misguided towards the wrong things. But what happens when love is aligned? When love is aligned properly, what does that look like? And that is where a Christmas story starts to separate from The Christmas story. See, a Christmas story is about a father's love for a lamp. A Christmas story is about a a child's love for a BB gun. And both of them, because of the way they put their blinders on, both of them, because of the way they allowed it to consume them, uh, it led to destruction. And each and every one of us, we we struggle with how to direct our affection sometimes. And, And each and every one of us certainly Put our love somewhere that is just simply not God's best for us. So what does it look like when love is aligned? We're going to go back to 1 John. Just a few verses down from the verse that was shared with you this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verse 11. It says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. Perfection uh, in scripture oftentimes means complete, mature. You want to experience the complete, mature love of God. We love one another. It says, God abides in us. It says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love of God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected, completed, with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. This letter was written by by John, and and John also wrote one of the Gospels, this recollection we have of Jesus' life and ministry. At the very beginning of the book of John, he tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is, the Word came to abide with us. And because of what Jesus did, and because of the ministry, and because of what he both taught and modeled to us, and because he became the Savior of the world, Not only did he come to abide in us, now we can abide with God because he left us his spirit. The most perfect love that we can experience is when our our love is mitigated by the love that is reflected to us from Christ in Scripture. We hear a lot, and this is is my soapbox, but we we hear a lot about the, the war on Christmas. I mean, when you're flipping through the TV channels and the news and and your Christian magazines, and there's a war on Christmas. They want to take Christ out of Christmas. It's reflected in what, what kind of Christmas cards we send out. How many of you look for Christmas cards that say Merry Christmas, not Happy Holidays or Season's Greetings, right? Yeah, praise the Lord. Um, 
it's reflected a couple years ago we were fighting about coffee cups, right? And, you know, they don't say Merry Christmas or they should have snowmen or stars or whatever. Here's the thing. When somebody says happy holidays, anybody know what the word holiday means? Holy day, there it is. So even when, even when, this is fun, even when an atheist says happy holidays, <laughs> do you know what they're saying? One of the holy days that surrounds this season. Seasons, greetings, that's fine too. God made all four seasons. Some of them we experience all four in a day. Here's the thing. If your Christmas card says happy holidays or season's greetings instead of Merry Christmas, that's not a war on Christmas. The fact that that nativity scene has to sit back there in our church and not necessarily on the lawn of City Hall, that's, that's not a war on Christmas. That's a, a decorative inconvenience. We lose the war on Christmas when Christians, folks that claim to follow Christ, display anything to the world other than the love that Christ taught and modeled to us. Period. So the question we have to answer, especially in this season, the season that is marked by hope, by joy, by peace, by love, do you want perfect love? Because we have all experienced love in various capacities, and I think about the love that I have for my wife, and almost everything I do for her is motivated out of love. But I'm, I'm human, so some things I do for her are motivated out of obligation. Some things I, I, I do for her no motivated out of, out of duty or just simply what you're supposed to do. No relationship that you have is 100% motivated by love. No person acts toward you 100% motivated by love except the relationship we can have with God through Jesus Christ. Do you want perfect love? For some of you, that means for the first time making a commitment to Jesus Christ. To say, you know what, I've, I have allowed love of stuff, love of things, love of my past to direct my affections, but I've never leaned wholly on Jesus Christ. And it's time that you make that commitment in your life. For many of us who've made that commitment, we call ourselves Christians, but we know that oftentimes it is so easy it is so easy to allow our affections to be directed toward the wrong things. It's so easy to allow us to be consumed with love of things that are so cheap and so unwanted. You can surrender those things to Jesus. Jesus came for those things, that thing that you won't let go to. Imagine not yielding the call of Christ because you have great stuff stuff that you don't want to let go of. Will you bow your heads with me for just a moment this morning?